Hi, it's Ray from Pro Shaper Workshop in Charlton, Massachusetts. We're back on the uh, YouTube English Wheel. This is the one you can buy the plans for on my website, ProShaper.com. And uh, thanks for all the views. We got a whole bunch of views, and uh, we're doing really good on a YouTube channel. We can always do better. Please share these videos everywhere you possibly can. Tell your friends, your car clubs, whatever. And uh, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to work on this panel some more. This is the one we stretch shaped. There's no kick shrinking, there's no malleting, there's no nothing. And uh, that was part one and we're going to do part two tonight. And uh, this wheel was used extensively at my class last weekend. And uh, I had a total beginner uh, student, well, I was like four beginner students, they had never touched an English wheel before in their life, never shaped a panel or anything. And one of the guys from Florida, he came up and one of the, one of the projects that he did was he made this panel and this was like an arbitrary piece of, of sheet metal we took out of the small uh, stock rack and um, I showed him how to make this panel here and to finish it you would have to weld on another section here. This could be all done in one piece if you wanted to but we just started with a, uh, a small rectangle piece and this was done with both shrinking and stretching with the mallet with the shrinking uh, gathering tool and the shrinking facilitator and you can see the beautiful finish and he did it all on the YouTube wheel it still needs a little bit, but it fits pretty nice, and he was super happy. He learned his lesson, and he did about four or five other projects. So let's go back to the YouTube wheel here. Uh, because it got heavily used, first thing I want to do is clean it up. Now, I do have a video showing how to clean these wheels. You use the, I just did the uh, tool video the other day, and I used my uh, Harbor Freight little air grinder with the little adapter that we make and this is the foam pad with the stick it paper and this is 600 paper uh, and I get the, the foam pad and the paper at McMaster.com and we're going to spin this up with a drum sander this is the rubber from a drum, drum sander on a cordless drill and we're going to spin the wheel like that and basically make the wheel into a lathe and Take the sander and that removes all the, the build up. Sometimes the metal will fleck a little bit and uh, glove debris and all kinds of little foreign material can attach itself to the top wheel so you got to constantly police it and that polishes it all up really nice. Now we're going to do the same thing on the bottom wheel. Now the bottom wheel doesn't show the faults so much. The top wheel, if it has a little foreign material on it, will print on the panel and you'll get it you know, like a hundred times and it's, you have to be vigilant all the time watching for that foreign material. So this is a, the highest crown wheel I got, so I'm, I'm going to clean this one and then probably clean the other one because I'm not going to use this high crown wheel, but I'm going to clean it since it's in there anyways. That 600 paper will just basically polish. It won't remove any material or anything, and any of the foreign material will come out. So let's do the other wheels, same procedure. All right, I got all the wheels clean now. The top wheels, the four, the four anvils are all clean. And now we're going to go back to our panel. We're going to hopefully get this done tonight. And the main feature that you see right now is this little hump and this little hump. Everything else is fitting pretty good in here. It's not bad. And I call these peaks. And when you see a peak like that, everybody wants to run over to the kick shrinker or whatever. And you can do it that way, but I don't like the marks it leaves. So what that tells me is right here, 
right in board from it, it needs more area here. Right here, it needs more area. And then we're going to put it in the wheel and we're going to pull it down like this, which gives you a nice little fulcrum effect. And that'll cause that to want to go this way. So we got to unclamp it and we'll roll it out. Now just mark it here and I'll mark it here with the just oil on my finger. Plus I can visually see it. So we'll do this one first. We'll add a little area right in here. I can go this way or I can go that way. It doesn't make any difference. Most of the wheeling has been done this way. This is the more efficient way, but now I'm trying to localize what needs to happen to the panel. change the direction and then we'll do that hold down deal. Mark asks, what kind of pressure are you using there, Ray? Yeah, I should have mentioned. Uh, there's, I call three pressure zones on every English wheel. There's the first pressure zone is where it first starts to engage. Right there. See, it's not engaging. So we, we turn the wheel until it starts to engage. There's very little resistance and that pressure zone is used for a couple things. One, really really subtle defects that could be only a couple thousandths of an inch down but you can spot them when you put it in the light. Uh, you don't want to do a higher or medium pressure with a very subtle defect in your surface. So the low pressure zone has its uh, uses but most of the time you're going to be in the medium pressure zone and we always watch this red ball that's the indicator where we are as far as the tightness goes and the other indicator of course is the feel of how much resistance so and then you can see how much you're loading the frame of the machine the frame is like a spring and it has to move this is the opening up part of it. It has to move in order for you to negotiate a panel that might be a little bit thinner here and thicker over here. And if, you, if your wheel is too strong, too rigid, you won't be able to negotiate between the thin parts to the, or navigate between the thin parts and the, uh, the thicker parts. On a power hammer, it doesn't matter because that's a, a intermittent uh, tool that's striking every time it makes its cycle. This is a constant contact machine. So we're in the medium pressure. If we went into the high pressure, we'll get action faster, but you can get wheel marks a little bit and little stop marks. Every time you uh, come to a stop, you get a little bit of stop mark, and the parameters of each zone is really, really, really light on the low pressure side. That's where you're barely even turning the wheels, uh, and you can use that for pulling, pulling down and changing, putting a radius in and stuff, and then when you go into the medium pressure zone, you're adding area and consistently adding area and if you're in the light part of the medium pressure zone you're not adding area fast but if you go into the heavy medium pressure zone you are adding area a little a better rate and you'll generally yield a really nice surface in that medium pressure zone if you really load the, the uh, pressure up and you go into the high pressure what you do once in a while to maybe settle down uh, uh, tuck uh, gathers and and shrinks that you've done, or, or the walnuts that if you pounded it out and, and it's got all the hammer mallet marks on it, and you want to get those out quick, you might bring those uh, with higher, fix those with higher pressure. But generally, I run in the medium pressure zone, which still there's very little resistance, and all my wheels are uh, basically made with tubes 
so that there's no a lot of mass that you're turning. If you've got a big wheel with a lot of mass, uh, it's, it's difficult on your arms after a while. One of the first wheels I, I put together, I found a solid block of tool steel that was all machined perfectly and everything, and I had to do a little dressing on it, and, and uh, it had barren, uh, uh, barren seats, and I was able to put an axle in it and everything, but the thing weighed 85 pounds, and you really could build your muscles up with that one. This you can uh, reciprocate back and forth really easy because it doesn't have that heavy mass, which you don't need. So now we've done a bunch there. We'll see what we did in a minute, but first we'll see if we can pull this one over now, and we'll see how much this improved. Let me give it a little more pressure. You can watch that just going from the peak to heading down, settling down to where you want it. And then when you remember when you go in, you go in at a 45 degree angle, let you right in. Now the edges on this are pretty nice, so I have, I'm not using my gloves tonight. Not using your gloves gives you an advantage because you can feel the surface and feel for any uh, defects. You're looking in the light all the time. Now when I went diagonal like that, this is pretty low crown wheel, I could feel a little resistance. That was the, the bottom anvil's outer edges were biting and because it was more curved than that the anvil had, so I had to change it to this direction. As soon as I felt that little drag, I knew I was going to get some wheel bite. And this panel, most of the action is up on the top half of it. There's a little bit of curve down here, and I <coughs> might have overdeveloped it a little bit, but it's real easy to let it out just on the sides here. You see it shines up really nice. All right, let's see what we got now. So first thing we want to do is we offer it up. I've got some some home. I put the tape here where we got to put it every time. And first thing we're going to do is we got to set the arrangement. See, we've we've got this rock here, which is all arrangement. So we're going to go over to the bench, and we're just going to put a little curve into it here. That's just bending. Now we'll clamp it on and see where we're at. All right, after about five minutes, that initial wheeling, we were going after this peak and there was a peak over here. I suppose it's the way we clamp it. And uh, we've improved them. I really didn't quantify them. I should have at that last interval. But let's quantify them now. This one looks like it came down a little bit. This one probably, I don't know if it looks worse or what, but it doesn't matter. And the easy way to quantify it is just use your fingers. I can't get two fingers in this one. They're pinching. So it's like, uh, okay, I put my thumb in to about right there. There's my measurement. That's an easy measurement to go by. And this one, I don't have a wire. So I can see that it's about three quarters of an inch, it still has to come down to, to be able to be uh, flow into that wire right there. So now we still got to do some more here and that will be verified because it's tight on, on these back wires right here and then we have to put some more in this area right here. So we'll unclamp it and wheel it in those two areas again.
All right, we're all set. The peak was right here, so right inboard of the peak, that's where I'm going to put more area. All right, a couple, three more minutes. We're not really worried so much right now about surface quality. That'll be the last thing. We're doing the, the fitting. This is the gross development of the shape, which I called the first step in making any panel. And that's, uh, you can see we started out with a flat panel. And right now I see a bulge right there. So it looks like an anomaly to me, and it looks like I'm going to have to do a little more work right there. So instead of clamping it up, I'm going to put a little more work right in there. My back's been hurting me. I turned and uh, was lifting and turned or something, and I've had a couple days of lower back pain. So, so you can sit down also when you can wheel. Mm. And, and you know, when you hold it up to a white surface, uh, my walls are, they were white, you know, 30 years ago, I guess, but now they're kind of uh, dusty looking. But they're enough that you can hold it up to the horizon view and you can see how that flow is. If there's an anomaly in the flow, you're going to see a little up and a down, a wave formation. The ups I call strongs, the lows I call weaks. You have to bring the weeks up to the strong so it flows really well. And you, get, you can rub it with your hand and you can feel any imperfection. It doesn't feel too bad. There's a little stop mark or something over here. So let's clamp it back on and then we'll show you what happened. All right, we got it all clamped up and uh, we're a little bit closer. I expected it to be a little bit better than that, but uh, it's being a little reluctant. And sometimes you'll see leaps in progress rather than incremental. So let's give it another blast. And uh, it, again, it's the same spot. It's right here. This is where this makes this tight tur current turn right there. And this is pretty straight. It has a little bit of curve to it, and that's fitting pretty nicely. Uh, it might be a little bit overdeveloped here. We can fix that very easily. But our main concern is getting these down right flat. So we'll unclamp it and give it a little more. All right, so we're going to pump those areas up a little bit more. And the lesson here is, as you've seen, I, I work for about somewhere between two and five minutes at a time. And then you have to feed back off either flexible shape pattern or your buck. And the buck is the blueprint, and if you ignore the blueprint, you're going to not have the results that you want. So, uh, one of the common things that happen at my class is everybody is, uh, they, they want instantaneous results, and this craft does not yield instantaneous results. The only way you can get instantaneous results if you invest in a big giant press that, you know, like, I don't know, probably half a million dollars or a million dollars, and then the die sets, and boom, you can stamp out the panel. But this stuff is labor added. All the energy that's expended when you press a piece of steel into a panel is quite a bit of energy, and we're doing the same amount of energy in order to create the same panel. 
but we have to do it incrementally, a couple minutes at a time, check it. Now, with the flexible shape pattern, the advantage of that is you can check, you can work the panel out of arrangement and then check with the flexible shape pattern with the panel out of arrangement. If you only have a buck, be it a wood buck or a, a metal buck, like a wire form, you have to have the panel in arrangement in order to get the information from that buck. So the process is oftentimes taking the panel out of arrangement or by just virtue of working the panel in the English wheel or the power hammer, it normally kind of opens it up like this and it'll put it in a curl arrangement. And uh, that allows you to use the lower crown tools that yield the nicest surfaces, but you have to keep changing the arrangement in order to be able to feed back off the buck. If you have a flexible shape pattern, you don't have to. You can go to about 90% or 95% of development with your flexible shape pattern, and then the last 5% if you have a buck, you can feed back off your buck. So that's poking its head up a little bit there. There's a little bit of a a peak right there, so we're going to pull that down too, do a little inboard stretching from where that peak was showing. So if you tend to get frustrated and you know you're not think the results aren't happening fast enough, you really don't have to use your whole brain to do this. It's actually pretty pretty easy once you learn the the techniques. And uh, you can daydream about you know other aspects of the car that you're going to be building or the restoration that you're doing, the next step. It doesn't require your total consciousness to, to do a lot of this stuff. When you get to the surface quality level, that's refining the shape, which will be the next stage once we get it fit on the buck, then we have to pay really close attention for any surface anomalies and how to fix them. Now a surface, the, the wheels are yielding a really nice polished surface here. And this is all stretch shaping. It's compression shaping. We're compressing the metal between the two rollers. If we were using a planishing hammer, it'd be between the two planishing hammer dies. If we were using a power hammer, we'd be compressing it between the two power hammer dies. Now the other methods of doing this would be what I call elastic, which is when you go onto a beater bag and you take a mallet and you elastically pull the metal apart and it has a limit. You can only go so much before the metal protests. And uh, the first protest that the metal does is it, it gets a little discolored you'll see it either aluminum or steel, it'll, it'll whiten a little bit. And those are like little stretch marks. And if you put it under a microscope, you'd probably see all this stuff and you'd say, oh my God, the panel's ruined. But once you power hammer it or English wheel it on those spots, it cold forges it all back together again and makes it uniform. The metal, even though it's not hot, will forge together. Now, malleting and using elastic methods are generally a little faster, but it's choose your poison, whatever you want to do. Everybody falls into a routine that they particularly like, and the danger is that in this craft is you start to get uh, a little cocky in thinking that your way is better than everybody else's way, and um, all the ways that have been tried around the world work really well and it can be argued maybe some might be a little bit better than others but they might be slower than the others and uh, 
all these panels are going to have a certain amount of filler on them, not Bondo or, or lead or any gross filler like that, but they'll have primers. If you do the job right, all you need is a primer. And uh, primers today are just amazing. All paint systems are amazing today. So you can hide a lot of sin with just paint today. They got high build primers that uh, will fill a lot of defect. And uh, a lot of those paints today, which are very expensive, really stand up. When, back in the 60s when I was working at my grandfather's restoration shop, all, we, we first were painting all the cars, and these were packets and Duesenbergs and Rolls Royces and Bentleys. That was his uh, main uh, clientele. And uh, we would use the uh, nitrocellulose lacquer. And I still believe that that yields the nicest looking paint job ever. That uh, really deep shine on nitrocellulose lacquer. But put it out in the sun for 30 days and uh, it, it loses its luster, it's, it, it potentially has micro cracks, it's all kinds of problems that happens with it. And I think that came out, uh, nitrocellulose lacquers came out in the mid-twenties when they were trying to ramp up production speeds at the manufacturers because prior to that they would use enamels which they would have to bake and force dry and stuff or before they were baking them, they just have to wait till everything dried. So uh, the nitrocellulose lacquers really helped quite a bit, but they just didn't have the longevity on for the finishing systems. And then they came out with acrylic lacquers, and I believe it's probably just, they were very similar. They lasted a little bit better than the nitrocellulose, but the, the big leap was when they started coming out with uh, all the two-stage paints and everything and um, I never really got into that at my grandfather's. I left uh, working for him in 1975 so um, we had done uh, some chassis in Imran and stuff but no two-stage jobs or anything. Today everything is the epoxy paints and epoxy primers and the uh, the paints are just absolutely amazing. Of course, as you know, they're expensive. A gallon of a red can be thousand dollars for a gallon. Special hardeners and special thinners and it just goes crazy. So we should see a pretty good improvement this time, I think. That's probably five minutes. And I'm concentrating on this side part of it here because, like, as I mentioned, there's very little crown on this end. So we'll clamp this up. First, I've got to set the arrangement. I've got to bend it on the bench. And then we'll clamp it up. Okay, there's where we are now. We've got it all clamped up. And as we make the panel uh, closer to its goal, we put more clamps on it. Now people might say, well, he has to put all the clamps on here because it's all springy. No, we're in the development f the phase of, of building this panel. And once we get it done, meaning we set the area value, which is required to conform to this uh, rear fender, and it has an area value that's out there that we're trying to get to, once we have that area value definition, then all we do is we set the arrangement and this panel will go on just like it was a stamp panel. There'll be no tension in it or anything. So now this is a, I don't know, a five thousandths feel of gauge or maybe it might be ten thousandths. And we can feel in behind here where it's hitting. And actually we're not clamped up enough yet here. Oh, let's get another clamp on here. Bring that down. 
we bring that top down a little bit like that. And we're hitting right here. We're hitting right here. And that, that one will be hitting a little bit right in here. So it's mostly here and here. So now we have a target. We're gonna be more, doing more of the same pretty much. And uh, I hope, I don't know if I'll get it all the way down tonight or not, because I don't wanna make the video too long. Uh, some people like the long videos, some people want instantaneous gratification and they tune out after four minutes or so. So it's a hard thing to juggle to try to satisfy everybody. Uh, but I want to give you an idea of what we're going to do with this panel and this, I didn't have this idea initially, but we're evolving it. As you can see, it's a beautiful panel. I call this the English system where you're just using the English wheel, you're stretch shaping it. And uh, technically, I probably could have made that panel go all the way over here. And, uh, but if I did that, I might have lost some of my dent resistance right in here. So I didn't go all the way over. And I chose, we're going we're gonna to cut this all nice and square. And we're going to weld on a piece over here. And that will be part of the beginner's lessons that you uh, can benefit greatly from showing how to fit that other piece in right here and then we'll do some edge tipping this is going to have a wired edge on it but we'll tip it 90 degrees and that uh, end uh, generally will have a tip too we can tip a little bit of this bottom edge and that holds the curve when you put that little tip in there usually like a half inch uh, flange on the bottom and then the running board of bolts right in here uh, mating up to the rear fender so I thought about um, this rear panel that's going to get welded on and that has no shape in it, it's just barely, basically arranged. It's more of a flat panel. So what we'll do on that is we'll do a little welding uh, demonstration and this is 20 gauge um, and 20 gauge is uh, 35 thousandths of an inch thick and it can be a little intimidating for a beginner to weld it because they blow holes through it. So a lot of the people out there working uh, in their two-car garages and stuff have bought a, uh, a Lincoln or a Miller uh, MIG welder or maybe even a Harbor Freight MIG welder. And a lot of them use that MIG welder to be their go-to weld tool. And a lot of them have been reluctant to jump into a TIG welder. They're intimidated or they don't want to spend the money. They perceive the TIG welders as being very, very expensive. So what I'll do on this one is I have a $300 Chinese TIG welder, which I looked on eBay the other day, and they're, they're actually the same welder with more features now is like $200. So it's even lower than what you can get a, a, a decent MIG welder for. So I'll use that $300 Chinese sourced MIG weld, uh, TIG welder to weld half of the panel, and I'll use a MIG welder to weld the other half and we'll be able to compare that uh, experience and, and the results. And that'll be an upcoming uh, video in this beginner series. So we fit this, we still need a little bit more, and let's wheel it some more and then see where we're at. All right, as I mentioned, this is 20 gauge steel. Um, I use 20 gauge because it uh, is really nice and malleable. It's easy to arrange, you can bend it easily. Um, it's inexpensive and um, it gets all the results. It gives really good dent resistance. I got cracks in my knuckles. I can't hit it too hard here. But um, that's another thing we can do. We can do a dent resistance test on this panel after we get it all welded and everything. And, and we can also, after we get it all welded, we'll cut it in half and then measure it to see what the thickness change is. And uh, I think that'll be a good insight for everybody. Now, people say, well, you know, why aren't you using 19-gauge, uh, which typically is what I would use is 19-gauge, which is 40,000 thick or one millimeter for the rest of the world. And um, it used to be readily available in New England, but it just seems like it's, uh, it's next to impossible. I called a bunch of uh, steel suppliers the other day, and everybody they just scratching their heads. They said, no, we don't have 19-gauge. Uh, we can't get it, and blah, blah, blah. It's still available, but I'm going to have to truck it in. Uh, I don't have a big demand for it because I really prefer to do aluminum work. 
Uh, once you try aluminum, you don't want to go back to steel. As I mentioned before, the projects all take a lot of time and steel projects will humidity rust depending on where you're located. We only have the problem in August, but uh, there's a lot of places in the world that uh, humidity rust will turn the thing red in overnight. So if you have aluminum, you don't have that problem. Aluminum panels uh, generally will work a little faster. I have that really uh, stubborn Chinese sourced uh, 063 uh, 3003 aluminum that I use a lot and that gives a superb dent resistance but it is stiff it's like working at least 16 gauge steel it's so tough but it's malleable once you get it going it, it seems to soften up a little bit uh, 18 gauge steel works pretty much the same as this 20 but it'll be much stiffer doing your arrangement uh, and it will soften up a little bit too as you as you start to develop your panel so let's spend another couple three minutes here four minutes and wheel this a little more and then check it out i don't think i don't think we're going to be able to finish this tonight because i don't want to make the video go on too long Now this end doesn't get much attention, so I'm going to wheel right up close. Remember, it's the center of the wheel where the action is. So I don't want to bring the end of this panel right on the center of the wheel. If I do that, I'm going to be stretching that edge out. If I stretch the edge, it reverses the process. It's an add-subtract medium. You add area by working in the interior of the panel. You subtract the area by working on the edge of the panel. So I'm 45 and now across this outer edge. What's that do again? Huh? What's that do again? The 45s allow you to work right up to the edge without going off the edge. You can 45 one way and then 45 the other way. It works the panel inboard and evens it up with the outside edge. Uh, it's a procedure you're going to use on every single panel. Now we'll do it down here a little bit and settle that. That hasn't had much attention. Every single square inch of a panel has to have attention. On the edges, it's very little. I mean, not the edges themselves, but up to the edge. Just a very little attention, but you have to give it some. That little corner down there hasn't been wheeled, so we're going to go into that corner. All right, we'll set the arrangement again and see how it looks. Should be a little bit better. You can see from our beginnings, 
where we had just a flat blank, there is a lot of shape in this panel. A lot of shape. And, and the panel has a nice noise too. When you, uh, you get a nice ring out of it. Like a symbol. All right, here's where we're at. We got a significant improvement. Let's see what my thumb does now. I can barely get my thumb just into this far right here. This was about three quarters of an inch. I give that a little push. That's greatly improved. That's about a half an inch or so. It's hard to see because we're not going on this wire. I have to project over. The surface quality is really nice. Uh, there's a few little stop marks here and there. And uh, I think you get the idea. We're just going to need a little bit more. And I'm not so sure that the next video in this series uh, would be well served by just doing more of the same. I suppose you could get bored watching me just do this four more times or whatever to settle those in. So maybe the next time we'll, we'll get this other panel fit and we'll have these all done when we do this panel over here and get that, we'll engineer the joint and we'll do that MIG versus TIG welding experiment. Edge tipping has to be done. So that's it for tonight. Ray from Pro Shaper Workshop in Charlton, Massachusetts. Uh, thanks for watching. And like I said, share the videos as much as possible. Uh, check out our website, uh, proshaper.com. Thank you very much. It's Ray Shaleen.